Well, uh, this morning we start uh, a new series. We're picking back up in the book of Mark. I can't believe that we left the book of Mark in November. It feels like longer than that. We survived the Christmas holidays and uh, uh, we survived uh, New Year's. And so now we're sort of back into a normal routine. I've entitled the series Marked. And uh, as I said, we stepped away for a few months from the gospel of Mark. I wanna bring you back up to speed. We've been away for a little bit. Back up to speed, Jesus is still in these private teachings with his disciples. If you remember where we left off at the end of chapter nine, uh, Jesus was in these constant private teaching moments. He's investing and pouring into the disciples. Uh, I want you to think for just a few moments, last year, 2017, all the incredible things that we heard from Jesus as we walked through nine chapters of Mark's gospel. He said things like, believe in me. He said, repent of your sins. Turn from your sins and follow me. Deny yourself. Be willing to forsake everything for me, Jesus said. Relinquish the control of your life, Jesus commanded. Be willing to die to yourself. What a command. He goes on to say, take up your cross and follow me. Put others above yourself. Think of of what that entails. He said, take last place. Be a servant. The list goes on and on. All these incredible things for 11 months last year that we walked through the teaching of Jesus. This was pretty radical teaching when you think about it and you break it down line by line. Jesus is saying some radical things in the gospel. He's calling us to a radical lifestyle of serving him. He took us to school on trust in the first nine chapters of Mark's gospel. He took us to school on prayer. He certainly took us to school on faith. He took us to school on pride and humility in the first nine chapters of Mark. So the question for us is what is Jesus saying to us now in in the remaining six chapters of this incredible gospel? What instructions are Jesus giving us? And well, I, I want us to look, I want us to go back into the gospel. We pick up where Jesus is leaving Capernaum. If you wanna stand with me and turn to Mark chapter 10. Jesus is leaving Capernaum. This is not un, uncommon for him. He's leaving Capernaum. He's heading south toward Judea. And as he enters this area, he, he, he finds himself in a conversation with the Pharisees. And you know, you remember about the Pharisees, right? What are they always trying to do? Trick Jesus, uh, stop the gospel. They're, they're trying to shut him down. And so he finds himself in, in the middle of a converse, conversation about one of the most controversial topics of our day. And clearly it was an issue in his day or the Pharisees wouldn't have questioned him about it. And this challenging topic that we're going to unpack today is about divorce. Uh, these are delicate situations and delicate, it's a delicate subject and so I've prayed really for the last two weeks about this message and, and I believe the Lord's gonna help us navigate through this very hard subject. Let's pick up in verse one, we'll read the first 12 verses of Mark chapter 10. Then Jesus left Capernaum and went down to the region of Judea into the area east of the Jordan River. Once again, crowds gathered around him and as usual, he was teaching them. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him with this question, should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? Jesus answered them with a question, what did Moses say in the law about divorce? Well, he permitted it, they replied. He said a man can give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away. But Jesus responded, he wrote this command only as a concession to your hard hearts. But God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. And this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. Since they're no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. Verse 10, later when he was alone with his disciples in the house, they brought up the subject again. And he told them, whoever divorces his wife and marries someone else commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries someone else, she commits adultery. Uh, Hang with me for just a minute because I want us to pray. I I just want to say something before I go into this message. Not, Not one person in this room has escaped the impact of divorce. Whether it's a friend, whether it's a neighbor, whether it's an aunt, an uncle, a brother, whether it's your mom or dad, and if statistics are true, over 50% of you that sit in this room this morning may have walked personally through the pain of divorce. 
So I want you to hear my heart before we pray this morning. The last thing I would ever want for anyone in this room is to walk away from here, walking back through the pain and the hurt of a situation and a painful journey that you have walked through. I don't want you to walk out of here feeling guilt or shame this morning. That is not the purpose of this message. I don't want that for anyone. I wanna be extremely sensitive as we walk through this topic because I know many of you, I've sat with you, I know you bear the scars and the pain of someone walking out on you. And I know you bear the scars and the pain of that difficult, difficult, difficult journey of divorce. However, I believe that every one of you that have walked through the pain of divorce, you want me to talk about this subject today because you know how hard it is and you know how much it hurts. And so I'm gonna ask you to do something with me, particularly those that have walked through the pain of divorce. I'm gonna ask you to partner with me for the next 35 or 40 minutes. And would you pray? This message is really not for someone that's walked through divorce. This message is for somebody in the room today that's contemplating divorce. This message is for those, we have over 300 people watching us right now via stream. This message is for many of you that may be going to pick up the phone tomorrow and call an attorney or you have a meeting with somebody or you've been contemplating divorce. This message is for you. And I want you to know this morning that there are hundreds of people at Christian Life Assembly that are praying for you right now. And we want God's perspective on this issue. We want God's perspective on this subject. So those of you that have walked through this painful process, would you pray with me this morning? I think you can pray better than anyone in the room because you know what it feels like. Would you pray for that person today? Maybe there's just one in the room, but I believe the Lord wants us to hear his word on this subject today. Partner with me and pray. And during the message, I just even encourage you to pray and let's ask God to do something powerful today. Let's pray. Lord, we pray for that man or that woman in the room today that's contemplating walking away from something that maybe they've invested many years of their life in. Maybe they've been married 10, 20, 40 years and they're just, they're just feeling like there's no hope anymore and this is, the, this is the only step or maybe the last resort. And God, I know that many people in this room have walked through the pain of that and they're praying right now for, for that person, for that man, for that woman. And God, we ask today that they would leave here not with the words of a preacher but with your word and, and your perspective and what do you say about this very difficult subject of divorce. Give us clarity today. Holy Spirit, I ask that you speak. Hide me behind your cross. I just wanna say your words today. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for praying and partnering with me today. I really believe that the Lord's gonna do something powerful in someone's life. I didn't wanna preach this message. I have to be really honest with you. And it's not because as a preacher, I want to avoid hard topics. We've been journeying together for many years now. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with hard topics. This particular topic of divorce, it brings up so much hurt and so much pain and so many scars. And so again, my prayer all week for the last few weeks has been that the spirit of the Lord would go before me and then he would touch your heart. Listen, if there's any confusion about the subject of divorce, it's not because God has given us an unclear or a veiled picture of the topic. Now, I've said this to you many times before in other messages, and I actually do not believe that we are living in a divorce crisis in, the, uh, in our culture or even in the American church. I think we're living in a marriage crisis in the American church. And I think what we really need to focus on is not necessarily the, the topic or the concept of divorce. What we need to focus on in 2018 moving forward is how do we get families and marriages healthy? Because when you get marriages and families healthy, then you don't have to talk about divorce. And so we have a marriage crisis, not a divorce crisis. We've lost sight, even in the church, of what biblical marriage is all about. So just for the record, I wanna make it clear that biblical marriage is one man and one woman in a covenant before God for life. Now that's not what you will see on the media today. That's not what you will find on CNN. It's not what you will find on, on some other uh, news outlet. Uh, probably no media uh, outlet it, it will say it that way. But God says it one way, and he makes it really clear. Biblical marriage is one man, one woman, and a covenant before God forever, for life. That's biblical marriage. Our culture does not define it that way, but God defines it that way very clear. So here's the truth about divorce. And we get the truth about divorce when we ask, how does God view it? 
And, and, and you can talk that, you, you can ask that question about any subject of today. When you really wanna know how God views something or, or, or what our culture should view it, that's the question we have to ask. Well, how does God, how does God view it? How, how does the word of God view it? Not what I think about it, not what my peer group thinks about it, not what the media thinks about it, but what does God think about it? And so that's the question we have to ask ourselves today. How does God view divorce? I've been asked this question in ministry literally hundreds of times. And hundreds is probably not even accurate. In 20 plus years of ministry, I've been asked this question probably thousands of times. Here's the short answer. And the short answer is not given by me. It's given to us by God through a prophet named Malachi. The last prophecy of the Old Testament is found in Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, where God says this. I want to read three verses. Here's another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, weeping, and groaning because he pays no attention to your offerings and doesn't accept them with pleasure. You cry out, why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made when you were young, but you've been unfaithful to her. Though she remained your faithful partner, the wife of your marriage vows, didn't the Lord make you one with your wife? In body and in spirit, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. So guard your heart, remain loyal to the wife of your youth. And here's the answer. This is God's perspective on divorce. For I hate divorce, says the Lord. The God of Israel, to divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart and do not, be un, do not be unfaithful to your wife. There's the truth about divorce. There's the truth about God's perspective on this subject today that we call divorce that Mark is now dealing with in the 10th chapter. That's God's attitude toward what today has become so widely accepted both inside and outside of the church. So it brought me to this place in my study of why, what would bring God to, to make such a statement? Why would God speak about divorce through the prophet Malachi at the end of the Old Testament? And the answer really ha takes us on a journey back in history. I wanna give you a little background. The Jews had come back from their captivity in Babylon. Remember, because of their idolatry, they were taken captive to Babylon. After 70 years of captivity, they returned to Israel for, if you read the Old Testament, for what is really a process of, and a season of rebuilding. After 20 years of being back in the region, they rebuilt the city of Jerusalem. They even rebuilt a temple, not as spectacular as the first one, but it was, it was a temple. And with 100 years of being outside now of captivity, listen, they had once again made their religion nothing more than a ritual. One of the things you see in the Old Testament is this pattern and this cycle with the Israelites. What happens? Serve God, fall away, repent. Serve God, fall away, repent. Over. Sounds familiar to our culture, right? Just this circle, this pattern of, 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 of around and around and around and around. And so God used a prophet, a man named Malachi, to point out that once again, now their attitudes toward God were unrighteous and their hearts had once again become hard. And they were characterized by hearts that were full of sin and hearts that were full of disobedience. And Malachi prophesies in an effort to speak directly to the core, directly to the heart of the issue for them, which was sin. He defines their sin in a very specific way and he calls for them to do the one thing that they desperately needed to do above anything else and it was repent. And I have to tell you, this is so familiar and this is so uh, a walking parallel with our culture today, right? Because the very thing that we need to do in our American culture, inside and outside the church of Jesus Christ, we need to repent. The very thing that Malachi was calling the Israel's, Israelites to do post-exile is the very thing that our culture needs to do today. We need to stop worrying about all of these things we worry about and we need to fall on our face and repent before God. Because Malachi's prophecy was pointing out to a people that their hearts were hard and that they had sin in their life. See, the Jews of Jesus' day had made divorce acceptable. 
They were engaged in it. Listen, it, they were more than engaged in it. It was rampant throughout the culture of Israel. The very people, think of this. You flash forward now to Mark chapter 10. The very people who 400 years earlier in the Old Testament were told by Malachi and God even used Nehemiah to speak to them. They were told what God thought about divorce and now we go 400 years ahead. We find ourselves in the gospel of Mark chapter 10 and the very people 400 years earlier that God had used a man, a prophet to tell them what he felt about divorce. They're using the very topic to try to trap Jesus. We see it in Mark chapter 10 verse two. Some Pharisees came and tried to trap him. 400 years later, haven't learned their lesson, right? 400 years later, they're using this very question, should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? And so divorce becomes the topic of conversation now in the New Testament in Mark's gospel in chapter 10. It's important to know the context of who Jesus was speaking to. We've talked about them many times last year, these Pharisees. Jesus was teaching on the subject of divorce out of feeling forced to. This was not a topic that, that he was talking about and the Pharisees sort of tripped up or walked up and heard Jesus teaching about uh, divorce. No, they engaged him. They used this subject to try to trick him. They, they used this subject to try to trap him. They wanted to know his teaching or his opinions on this subject of divorce. You, you know what it tells me? They would not have used this subject if it was not sensitive even in Jesus' day, right? I mean, if, if divorce was a thing that was unheard of in Jesus' day, the Pharisees would have never used that topic to try to trick Jesus. They found the most controversial subject that they could find. They picked and selected the, the, what we would call the, the hot topic of the day, right? For the sole purpose of tricking Jesus. They would not have asked him a question that was easy. They're looking to ask him the questions that were hard. They're not gonna throw him a slow pitch over home plate, no way, right? They think that they have one now that's so controversial and so heated. They didn't go for the simple question, they went for the hard one. They're trying to catch him off guard. The Pharisees, as you know, were the, were the Jewish theologians of the day. They were conservative yet extremely legalistic. Again, we've been following them for 10 chapters now. It's important for us to know that the question that they asked, we're not talking about, about remarriage. The question was specifically about divorce. They asked the question, should a man be allowed to divorce his wife? Now, I love how Jesus handles these types of situations, these, these traps that are continually set for him. Look what he does. He answers their question with what? Look in verse three. Jesus answered them with a question. Don't you hate it when people do that to you, right? You ask them a question and they, 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 they throw a question right back at you. Well, Jesus did that. Jesus answered them a question. What did Moses say in the law about divorce? It's frustrating when that happens. And you can imagine how the Pharisees just probably notched up their frustration and anger at Jesus even more. They answered back. They answered back from the law of Moses. Verse four, well, he permitted it, they replied. So they're answering back to Jesus. They're quoting Moses. He said a man can give his wife a written notice of divorce and send her away. So they asked Jesus a question. He responds with the question and they answer back by quoting Moses. And they said, yeah, well, he, Moses says a man can do this. A man can give his wife a written notice or a decree of divorce. It's right out of Deuteronomy chapter 24. See, Moses, you have to back up a little bit. Moses had put a legal procedure of divorce in place. Now this legal procedure was designed to actually protect the woman. It was designed to protect the wife. Let me show you how. In Moses' day, men were putting away, that's probably the better way to say it, putting away their wives and just marrying other women casually. And this created a huge issue and a, and a huge problem for these married women that have now been put away. These women were now marked. They were permanently marked and outcast. They couldn't, they couldn't live their own lives. They, they couldn't even go and remarry again. Why? Because they're still married. 
Their husband didn't divorce them. Again, up until this point, there's no decree or written notice. They were simply just outcast. They were simply put away. They were total outcast. Moses was trying to resolve this very difficult and delicate social issue. What he's really trying to do, he's trying to help the women out. He's trying to say, you can't just put your wife away without some legal document. That's not even fair, it's not even right. You must have a decree of divorce. This process was actually intended to restore the woman and potentially even create a scenario where the marriage could be restored. The divorce decree would even require the man or the husband to return her dowry. And so what I believe Moses was trying to do, Moses was not trying to give a pathway to divorce. Moses was trying to stop this horrific process of just putting women out. He was trying to foster restoration is what he was trying to do. Uh, because a divorce decree could only be signed or approved by a rabbi, and the, uh, the part of that process would, would, would put, think of this, it's similar to today. We go to a, a marriage counselor. It, it would force this couple to at least stand in front of someone, to have some conversation. It was a stall tactic probably in some ways for, for the couple to spend some time and, and maybe potentially reconcile. Everyone in this room knows what it's like to be in a heated argument, right? And if you're in this room and you're married and you say you've never fought, you're lying, okay? And you're lying in church, which is even worse. <laughs> so every one of us, we've been in some sort of argument. Listen, aren't you glad that you didn't make life-altering decisions in those tense, heated moments? You know, aren't you glad that you didn't make some, some, some instant decision that, 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 that created pain and hurt for so many years of your life? That's exactly what Moses is trying to do. That's the basis of this legal document of divorce that Moses put in place in Deuteronomy chapter 24. Moses didn't command or instruct people to get a divorce. He simply permitted it. And again, he was trying to resolve an already challenging situation. So that's how the Pharisees answered Jesus. They quoted Moses. And remember, the entire motivation from the Pharisees was to do one thing, trap Jesus. They're not seeking his wisdom. They're not seeking his godly counsel on the subject of divorce. They're trying to do one thing. They are bent one way, and that's to silence and stop this man named Jesus Christ. And so Jesus responds. And in the next five verses, I believe Jesus gives the greatest teaching on marriage in the entire Bible. Because remember, we don't have a divorce crisis, we have a marriage crisis. And so Jesus gives the greatest teaching, five verses, the greatest teaching on marriage in the entire Bible. He turns the entire conversation uh, with the Pharisees from the legal issue of divorce, and he brings it back to what God designs marriage to look like. And he offers a completely different perspective on the issue. So as I said in the beginning, let's not talk about divorce, let's talk about marriage. Let's talk about how God views marriage. This is really what Jesus is saying to them. He doesn't wanna talk about divorce. He wants to show them what godly marriage looks like. I think today God would really rather us not talk about divorce. We almost have to because it's so prevalent in our, in our culture. But I think God would rather us talk about what does godly marriage look like? What, 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 is a, what does a, a, a life look like in, in the covenant of marriage where one man and one woman say, hey, we're not perfect, but with God as the center of our life, we can do this thing and we can honor Jesus and we can raise great kids and, and, and we can leave a legacy of what a godly marriage looks like. That's what I think the church needs to begin to focus more on. Listen to the words of Jesus in verse five. But Jesus responded, he wrote this command only as a concession to your hard hearts. Jesus is saying to them, Moses did not give you a, a, a free pass for divorce. He gave you a, a, a pathway to divorce only because your hearts are so hard. You have so much sin in your life and you're treating these women with, 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 such, uh, with such terrible treatment that, that Moses was forced to do something. He was forced to put a pathway of divorce in place. Moses didn't command divorce. Remember, he permitted it only because of their hard hearts, because they wanted their own way. 
They wanted to do life their own way. They didn't want to walk a path that God had created for them. They wanted to do things the way they wanted to do them. Doesn't that sound familiar again of our culture today? Sounds a lot like the world we live in. He goes on to say in verse six, here's the greatest teaching on marriage. But God made them male and female from the beginning of creation. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother, is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Think of that. Only God can do that. Only God can take two individuals from two different backgrounds, from, from, from two different paths, from two different perspectives, and, and only God can bring two people together and make them one. Heidi and I, many times, 20, almost six and a half years of marriage, and I think to myself, how did God take a, a boy from Arkansas and a girl from PA and put them together? Listen, we were a cultural head-on collision, right? All I wanted to eat for the first six years was fried pork chops and mashed potatoes, right? And she's like, what in the world? <laughs> Just a cultural head-on collision, right? But God takes two people, two individuals, a man and a woman, under the banner that we want to serve Jesus and we love God and he's the center of our life and he brings them together and two people now become one. Only God can do that. Only God, only the hand of the Lord can do that. And the two are united in one since they are no longer two but one. Let no one split apart what God has put together, what God has joined together. God describes marriage as the uniting of two people, not for a period of time, but two people for life. In marriage, you're no longer two, but what? One. Jesus is just quoting Genesis chapter 2. When he was teaching the Pharisees and the disciples in Mark chapter 10, Genesis 2, 24 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave, the King James, shall cleave unto his wife, and they will be or shall be one flesh. This shows the, the preeminency of marriage, that, 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 that it's God's plan, and, and God put it in place, and it can only happen through the power and the hand of God. Being joined together is literally being yoked together or, or bound together for life. So let me go back and answer the question. How does God view divorce? He hates it. And that's not my words. Those are the words of God. He hates it. It's not his plan. It's not his design for you. I think Jesus was so clear. God was so clear in the Old Testament. It's reinforced in the teaching of the New Testament. In his teaching on marriage, he made his position on divorce crystal clear. From Malachi to 400 years later to Matthew and to Mark and the gospel, Jesus is crystal clear on his position of divorce. And I believe that divorce is one of fallen humanity's ways of breaking apart something that God has established. Listen, now don't miss what I'm about to say to you. There are so many different views on divorce. There's so many different teachings on divorce. Different churches teach different things. Different pastors have different perspectives. Some say no divorce for no reason ever, period. It doesn't matter what. Some say it's allowed under certain circumstances, very specific situations. Some say divorce anytime for anything. I understand the world we live in. I fully understand that we have to deal with the sin and the depravity of the world. We live in a fallen world. I know that. And not everyone acts and lives the way Christ would want them to. I get that. And I know that some of you have walked through and lived in abusive environments and divorce was about survival for you and it was about survival for your children. Listen, God would never want you to live in an abusive situation. Listen to me today, both men and women. God would never want you to be in an environment where you are being, uh, being abused and where you are in danger or your children are in danger. Never, period. I've seen the devastation of abuse. I've walked with many and some of you in this, in this church and walked through that process. I understand for some, for some of you, someone left you. They walked out. You had no choice. Divorce was not even on your radar. I understand the pain and I understand the devastation of abandonment. I understand the pain and the devastation of abuse. I've sat with countless couples where someone was unfaithful. 
I've watched as someone left to be with another person. I understand the pain and the hurt of adultery. I know the pain and the hurt of abuse. I know I've watched the pain and the hurt of abandonment. I've watched the pain and the hurt of adultery. I understand that for many of you, divorce was not your primary option. It was not what you wanted, but you had no choice. Listen, the truth is we don't get to change or alter God's plan at the end of the day, right? We don't get to change God's perspective on this. I think Jesus speaks against divorce because he speaks so highly about marriage. I believe that when God says that, that, that he hates divorce, it's because he puts such emphasis on how, how great godly marriage can be. And so my prayer for you today is that your hearts, if you walk through the pain of divorce, again, I said in the beginning of the message, this message is not really for somebody that's walked through divorce. This message is for somebody that's contemplating divorce. And I wanna tell you, stop in your tracks right now. Listen, stop in your tracks, seek godly counsel. Most of the people in the last, I would say 10 to 15 years that have sat in front of me and said, pastor, we need some marriage counseling. It was their last resort. They had spent years trying to figure it out and they'd spent years doing things and they had spent all of this self-help stuff and, they, and, and they, make, they make a Christian counselor or they make a pastoral visit the, the last stop before they go to the courthouse. Listen, I wanna tell you, if your marriage is in crisis, let go of the pride of your life and reach out for some help today. Let go of the pride, let go of the stigma, let go of what you're afraid somebody that's sitting next to you at church might think. Listen, outside of your relationship with Jesus Christ, your marriage is the most important thing in your life and you need to treat it that way. And if you need help today in your marriage and your marriage is in crisis and you're contemplating, you're contemplating divorce, I urge you, I encourage you, seek help today. Seek counsel today. Because what therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder, scripture says. And see, when you view marriage that way, when you see the marriage the way Jesus sees it, a covenant for life, then we also have to view divorce the way God sees it. We have to see divorce through the same lens if we believe these passages in scripture. My prayer today is for you. I've been praying for weeks for you. Submit to God today. Submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ today. And listen, if you will submit your lives individually to Jesus, I promise you God can transform your marriage in a flash. I think many times we look for our spouse to bring us the deep satisfaction in life that only a relationship with Jesus can do. And when you do that, you put something on your spouse that there's no way they can live up to. I've been married 26 and a half years to the most incredible woman in the world. But she can't ultimately satisfy the deep longings of my heart. Only Jesus can do that. She brings great joy into my life. She brings me great fulfillment in life and I can't imagine life without her. But if I expect her to do what only God can do in my life, I will be disappointed in her every single day. So maybe the core of the crisis and maybe the core of the issue that you're walking through today is that you just haven't completely surrendered your life to Jesus and allowed Jesus to become the center of your life. I can never be the husband that I am called to be by God until I surrender my life to him. You can never be the wife that God intends and wants you to be and that your husband needs until you've completely surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. In closing, I wanna tell you this. Let me, ha let me tell you how to make marriage work. It's what I just said. Give your heart and life completely to Jesus. Two people totally in love with Jesus, two people seeking to honor Jesus in everything they do and say will be two people that are in totally in love and have the greatest marriage in the world. Doesn't mean you won't walk through crisis, sure. But if you treat your spouse the way you would treat Jesus, 
and you treat your spouse the way that Jesus would want them to be treated, can you imagine what God will do in your life and your marriage? Heidi's job in life is not to just come alongside of me and be my cheerleader all the time, right? Her job is to, is to spur me on to be everything I can be in Jesus Christ. My job in her life is to spur her on to be everything that Jesus wants her to be. And when you think your spouse's job is just to make you happy and your spouse's life is just to, is, is to bring all of these things to you, again, as I said, imagine the frustration. People say to me all the time, Pastor, you and Heidi seem to have a great marriage. Well, I do have a great marriage. I'm excited about that. I'm proud of it. I can't tell you if I'm a good husband. Only she can do that, right? <laughs> Only she gets to do that. But I'm ecstatic about my marriage. I really believe I'm blessed. I'm the happiest man I know. And I love Heidi more today than I did 27 and a half years, 26 and a half years ago when we got married. But listen, she's not married to a perfect man. Believe me but she's married to a man that wants to watch her be, as I said, everything that Jesus wants her to be. And I'm married to a woman that wants me to be everything that Jesus wants me to be. So, so we challenge each other spiritually. We, we, we spur each other on spiritually. We pray for each other. Try this. If you're here today and maybe your marriage is in crisis, ask yourself, when's the last time you prayed for your spouse? When's the last time you got before God and didn't ask God to fix her, okay? But ask God to bless her. And didn't ask God to fix him, but ask God to bless him and for God to pour his spirit out upon him. Get alone with God today and stop looking at yourself. Look in the mirror and say, how do I pray for him? How do I pray for her? And I'm gonna stop asking God to fix him and her right now. And today I'm gonna pray that God just pours his spirit out on him, his spirit out on her. I'm gonna pray that, 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 that he would surrender his life more to Jesus every day. I'm gonna pray that she would just fall totally in love with Jesus and she would become, because listen, two people walk in a path where they're totally in love for Jesus with Jesus are the perfect candidates to have a great marriage. Amen. So pray. Pray for your spouse, build them up, encourage them. And I close with this, marriage, it's not my words, it's the words of Jimmy Evans, one of the great teachers on marriage today. Marriage will work every time when you do it God's way. 100% of the time, marriage will work when you do it God's way. So if your marriage is in crisis today, ask yourself the honest questions, how are we not doing it God's way? What do we need to shift? What do we need to change? Am I praying for her? Am I praying for him? And do we need some help? And one of the great things about your church, whether you know it or not, is that we're here to help you. We're a church that still believes in pastoral care. A lot of churches don't have time for it today. I don't mean that in a negative way. I'm just telling you, we place great emphasis on it today. We have counseling in the church, we have many pastors that are trained as Christian counselors. We wanna help you. Reach out today. You don't have to walk this journey alone, okay? You've heard me say it over the last few weeks. Healthy families make a healthy church. And so we wanna help you. We wanna help your marriage. And we wanna help you move from just surviving to thriving in Jesus Christ. And your marriage is thriving. Stand with me, if you will. I want us to pray. I'm gonna invite our prayer partners, our pastors to come. I know a message like today doesn't fill the altars. I understand that. Very sensitive topic. So our prayer is, and my prayer has been that as you leave today, that the Holy Spirit will continue to speak it in your heart. And listen, if you felt the nudge of the Lord today, do something about it. It's easy to walk out of here, life picks back up, things happen, you can forget about this tugging, this nudging that you felt from the Lord today. Your marriage is too important. Treat it with great care. Reach out today. Lord Jesus, we love you. And oh Lord, we pray today, I pray for the one in this room today that's contemplating walking away 
I believe that you carved this service out today specifically for that person, that one, that two, those three people, whatever it may be, that are here today that are thinking about making this life-altering decision. Lord, I pray that you grab their heart today in such a powerful way that they can't shake it today. They, they, they can't feel a sense of release from it and they have to reach out. They have to make a phone call. They have to send an email. God, I pray that you would give them, this is why I just feel somebody in here today needs a sense of hope today in your life. Because you feel like there's no way that this marriage can be healed. There's no way that you can, that, that, that this situation can be fixed. I want you to know nothing is impossible in Jesus Christ. And so God, I pray that you give them a sense of great hope today. And Lord, I pray for those people that have partnered with me today and they've been praying all during this service. Lord, I pray that they would not walk out of here with a sense of guilt or shame, but God, today they would walk out with a sense of thanking you for what you've walked with them. You've, you've, you've taken the journey with them every step of the way in the most difficult and hard and painful moments. God, you were there and you've brought restoration to their life. You've brought healing to their life. You've brought hope to their life. And Lord, we again just pray for that one, that one that may be here today that needed to hear this word. One marriage, if one marriage is, is, is transformed and, and saved today, that's our prayer, Lord Jesus. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Listen, our altars are open. If you need prayer, I encourage you to come find a place to pray, find a prayer partner to pray. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord today.